concerns. So take courage in that, Brother Patrick, you and your precious family. I also want to extend my earnest prayer in regards to uh, Brother Denis. Uh, Denis, uh, um, Margaret, uh, Margaret and Denis, but specifically Denis, I understand that uh, his health is, um, could uh, be better, but as a church, I'm petitioning to every person that's listening right now, also the viewers online, uh, lift up Brother Denny in your prayers that the will and the power of God will be done for him. For when one hurt, we all hurt. Amen? So today's message, uh, I've entitled it, Jesus, Our Faith and Hope. Jesus, Our Faith and Hope. Won't you pray with me? Almighty God of heaven, what an honor and a privilege it is to speak your words. I pray that you anoint every word that was written for this message. If there's something here, O oh God, in the content that you did not approve of, I pray you silence it from the listener's ears. Only what you have ordained should go forth with your power and your authority and your approval. My prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we're looking at the scripture reading. You heard it. Uh, Jesus uh, is encouraging these Pharisees and scribes. In fact, by verse 18 of that same chapter, it says, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill Jesus Christ, because not only did he heal on the Sabbath, but he also broke the Sabbath. And they're cr criticizing him for many things. But Jesus goes on in the passage. He says, well, listen. You're pursuing to kill the only hope of your whole existence. Who threw out their medication? Who threw out their coats in winter? Yeah? Who threw out their life vest and threw away the boat, burn the boat on fire, and then pursue fishing across a mighty lake? But better yet, I can almost hear there's a wonderful husband here saying, who abandons their wife? when the man has to eat to work to bring home bread for his family. But the Jews, they had a different understanding. God had always made sure that through the history of this human race since the fall, he gave them something to establish faith and hope. The passage here, if you read with me, and if you're viewing, we're going through John chapter 5, 37 through 40. Jesus wrestling with these Jews who constantly rejected him. And he says, And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Verse 38 of chapter 5 of John. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent him you believe not. Stay with me now. They have the Old Testament memorized. And Jesus says, his words are not in you. That sounds weird. It's like being clothed and someone says you're naked. Being full and someone says you're empty. The words of God are not in you, yet it's in their brain. Something, when it entered their brain, the human agenda supersede and went before the power and the purpose of God's words. So it's not really so much of how much you know, but as so much as who you know. Amen? It's good to know with the words of God, but also knowing Him first and foremost is more powerful, for He indicts the content of the words and make them realistic in our minds. Amen? Verse 39, he charges them and he says, watch this now. Search the scriptures. In other words, go back to them. For you're killing your only hope and faith to get out of this sin-filled life. Search the scripture. Brother Ariel, where are you? He's here. Okay, praise the Lord. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. So they've studied these scriptures, the Old Testament laws and prophets. They've memorized them and assume salvation and eternal life while killing eternal life standing in their midst. 
faith and hope is before them. And they're saying, you are not our faith and hope. You are not the Mashiach. You have a demon. And we're seeking to kill you because you're making a mess of the Sabbath day. You cannot hear me, my wife says. Can you hear me? Not so much. Can someone hear me from the back? Gary, can you hear me? You can all hear me? Okay. I lift my voice like a shofar then. All right. So, and they are they which that testify of me. So what, uh, what Jesus is saying to them from Genesis 1.1 1, 1, all the way to Malachi, last verse, there's a testimony of me that is inescapable to the reader. But yet you've read it. You've missed me. You're seeking to kill me. You're seeking to kill your only faith and hope. And Jesus says, go back to it. Like taking a course in university and you got like a B and you thought you did so well. The professor says, nah, nah, nah. You're an A plus type of student. Go back and redo that course. Jesus says, go search the scriptures. I want to pause and share this real quickly. The entire Old Testament, Jesus is declaring that the entire Old Testament testifies of him. The four Gospels, they're a chronicle of Christ's life on earth while he was here. The book of Acts, they echoed the power of Christ, the church grew. And from Romans all the way till Jude, these are letters to church about Christ. And then by the book of Revelation, the final book, the first verse starts off by saying it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. So your entire Bible is Jesus. So Jesus says, go back and search. You missed something. Read that chapter again. Did they read too fast? Finally, verse 40. And you will not come to me that you might have life the faith and hope and the life that Christ brings. The entire, if you were to study the Hebrew writings, they would use scrolls that would look something like this. God has kept in the Old Testament before Israel festivals, for example, and prophecies. But I'll look at a few uh, uh, festivals real quickly to see how God was faithful to keep salvation, hope before his people all along. The civil calendar, official calendar of kings, childbirth, and contracts. But the sacred calendar, on the other hand, official calendar of sacred festivals. The first one, the Passover. That was instituted right there in Exodus. They were told to put the blood on the doorpost, the date, Nisan 14th, which is approximately March or April. Practically, it coincides with what's happening here today, for Jesus Christ was killed right in the Passover period. Can someone say amen? And it signified deliverance from bondage. I praise the Lord for Jesus Christ. For I was wrapped up in bondage from the moment I came forth from my mother's womb. Bad company, bad friends, bad choices, and Christ shows up, and deliverance came, and I will not cease to speak of him until I die or cause me home. The passage says in Exodus, when Passover was instituted, the first sacred uh, festival he, they, uh, was instituted to set the people free. It reads, Exodus 12, starting verse 2, This month shall be what? Unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. I want to go back real quickly. So it's taking off the actual sacred calendar. There were sacred calendar events within a calendar year that needed to have these events celebrated and keep reminding Israel that there's faith and hope in God Almighty. I go back here. Verse 5, read that one for me. So the lamb shall be without blemish. So it's no coincidence when John saw Jesus Christ for the first time, he said, behold the lamb of God. He sees a human being. But he said, behold the lamb of God. John is saying, I know the Old Testament, all the lambs that were slaughtered were foreshadowing the coming of Christ. Amen? They read it, they missed it. 
we're reading with humility of heart so we don't miss it. When we do the communion service, we're reminding ourselves that he died and rose to forgive, forgive us of our sins. Amen? Verse 6 says, And you shall keep it until what? The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel. So it's not some folks, some places, the entire congregation. Verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. And this is God establishing the Passover to instill faith and hope in Israel who were under captivity for hundreds of years. Stay with me now. Are you with me? And I will smite the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Passover symbolized judgment and redemption. When Christ returns according to Revelation's events, it is judgment and redemption. Amen? Verse 13, And the blood shall be unto you a what? For a token upon the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Look at that word, Passover. So when he sees the blood on the doorpost, he passes over, hence the word Passover. When Christ returns with great power and authority on this planet Earth, and he sees your devotion to Christ, your faith and hope in Christ, the wrath does not come near you, but redemption is what you are scheduled for. So all your sacrifices, the meetings, the board meetings, the, the rehearsals, and all the services you're doing, you're doing it all to bless others and also keep you close to Christ. Amen? And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a what? And you shall keep it as a feast unto the Lord throughout all your generation, you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So in other words, you'll not forget the slaughtering of an animal to institute the Passover. And you shall also observe the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. The next uh, uh, calendar event on the sacred calendar is Pentecost. Pentecost, the proxy, uh, other names would be Feast of Weeks or Day of the First Fruit, uh, Feast of uh, Harvest, and that was about 7th and 6th or June. Pentecost, 50th, literally mean 50, uh, interval of 50 days between Passover and Pentecost. So God made sure he had sacred events happening all along in Israel so they would not miss him. Prayer meeting every Wednesday, so we're close to God Almighty. Most Fridays, there's youth services, so we're close to God Almighty. Sabbath service, all day long, it's all about God Almighty. But the way to not miss your Savior is to do it with the right agenda. Tell him as it is, Lord, today I don't believe you really exist. Help me. Lord, today I cannot pray. Help me. He gives help. But never say, I have arrived. I have it all. I know it all. I need nothing then the words will lose their impact, their meaning, and faith and hope will be empty. Amen? Duration was one day, Deuteronomy 69. Significance indicated the completion of the harvest congregation offered to God wave offering and first fruit of their produce. Feast of Trumpets was another one. That was uh, Tishri 1st, which is September to October. Significance, blowing up horns and trumpets, morning till, praise the Lord. And uh, this was actually instituted uh, after the exile in Babylon. Public reading of the law and rejoicing was done for the children of Israel. Amen? Day of Atonement is another very, very important one. They're doing Day of Atonement, and Christ hasn't arrived yet. What's the symbol and the essence of Day of Atonement, Brother Ariel? That's Tishri 10th. It's approximately September, October for us. Significance, Israel sins atoned once each year. And before we get to the, the, the tabernacle feast, real quickly, stay with me now. Are you with me so far? 
I'm delivering something for you to understand when the Jews said, you're not our Messiah. God did his due diligence to give them these feasts that they'll not forget. Just like Christ has given us the, the communion service that will not forget. So if we know what ha occurred in the past, then we can fix what's happening in the present to shape our lives in the faith and hope of Christ. Amen? So go back, you understand, once a year, the priest would take the lamb, would be slayed, and then the blood would be sprinkled in the mercy seat, and the sins of the people are forgiven that whole year. And something unique in the Israel culture. Those who did not attend were cut off from Israel. So is it meaning that if someone's watching today, you're contemplating God, and if you will not attend and give him your life, when he comes, probation ends, and you're cut off from his eternal kingdom. And if you're here today, the same thing, right? But we hear his voice, so we harden not our hearts, amen? Tabernacle booth, or in gathering, real quickly, I'll go through these ones swiftly. Um, this one actually teaches from 15th September to October, and duration seven days. Significance of this one, completion of the harvest on the commemorates Israel's wandering in the wilderness during the festival. Uh, so that's why it's called Feast of Booth. So they're remembering that there were strangers in a weird land. So when it comes on to Jesus' faith and hope, they had it before them all along. Amen? And look at that last line there. The last day of the feast and mark the end of the sacred calendar year. And the feast was joyous. So when we're here today for the communion service, it's okay to be reverent, but in your heart, let it flow with joy for you're redeemed. No screw faces. In other words, no weird countenances on your faces. Have a joy in your heart. Yes, it's okay to be uh, uh, reverent and upright, but may your joy speak within your hearts for Christ and what he's done. Amen? They had another one, a uh, Feast of Lights, uh, which was a uh, post-exile time in Babylon, instituted by Israelites. It was actually instituted by the Maccabees in 164 BC. I'll go on to the final one there. The Feast of Purim is actually one that was actually instituted through Mordecai when uh, Haman's uh, failure to, 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 ex to actually annihilate the entire Jewish nation. So they had things to remind them constantly. It's like a marriage. Wifey doesn't hear the husband say, I love you, every now and then. She forgets the love. And vice versa. We need to hear it too. Husband, you sometimes mess up, but we still love you. Children need to hear reaffirmation that they're loved, and vice versa. Amen? So reminders are very important. And the, here you go. It says here um, the significance. It commemor commemorated Haman's failed plot against Israel. The evening of Adar 13, the entire book of Esra Esther was read publicly in the synagogue. The occasion was joyous. Communion is joyous. Why? We're redeemed people. When I watch sports with my sons and so forth, I see they jump for joy for one team. And when the game ends, they're still in the same state. And I want to outdo them in the joy for my Savior and Lord. I will not keep silent. Amen? And if you're a quiet worshiper, that's fine. But in your heart, I know you're outdoing me in your joy for Christ. Amen? Jesus, the Last Supper. As I bring this to an end here, so Jesus Christ, he's just having a meal with his disciples. And from nowhere he says, you know what? The Old Testament is loaded with these sacred calendar events. I want to institute something here for you. And he took bread, and when he had blessed it, he offered it and says, this is my body, which is what? Amen. And then following that, he took the wine and he says, drink. This is symbolic of my blood, which is 
spill for the remissions of sins. John chapter 6, he delivered the same message, and they say, well, we are not cannibals. We're, not, we're missing it, Jesus. Jesus says, well, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Too hard for us, Jesus. We're not cannibals. And they left and followed no more. Jesus turned to his apostles and said, will you also leave me? Still did not explain what the, what the, 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 the metaphor meant. They responded, where else? must we go? Are you not understanding the doctrines of the church? No problem, for there's nowhere else to go. And he says, salvation is with you, God Almighty. Amen? And thus it was established, the communion service. Paul says, I received of the Lord, which also I delivered unto you. So even after the fact, after Jesus finished it, guess what happens? Paul reiterated it, amen? Stand with me as I close with this wonderful thought. The sermon message is, Jesus, our faith and hope. I share with you this story that happened in the north when I was placed to pastor in uh, Sudbury. A wonderful lady came to me and said, Sir, my husband is sick in the hospital. Will you visit him for me, please? I said, No problem. He, was have, he had cancer and he was near death. I visited my special uh, sister's husband there in the hospital and we talked. And I said, I will pray to our great God that you are healed. He was not a believer. His faith and hope was to get healed and go back to his regular life. So in that prayer, I said, I would not be doing honor to my Father in heaven unless I were to tell you, the day you decide to give your life to God, I'll be honored to be the man that baptized you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We prayed. He was healed. And he went off to Mexico. About a year later on, he was rushed back. The cancer returned. And as he stood there in the hospital, I said to myself, okay, fine, my precious brother. You like to fish? I've never fished here in Canada. I will pray two prayers this time, that you're healed and that we get to go fishing together. He went through an eight-hour surgery. Stay with me. And I, was, uh, have a, I had a day off on the Sunday. And on that Sunday morning about 3 a.m. while I, my wife and I laid there, the phone rang. Brian got up 3 a.m., told the nurse, call my wife to call the pastor. The wife called me about 3 a.m. and the words were, Pastor, come, he wants to be baptized. I hurried over. And when I arrive, he says, I'm ready, Pastor. My life belongs to the Lord. He says, baptize me now, Pastor. The nurse heard and was eager and says, yes, can you not take some water and sprinkle him? I said, glad you ask. But allow me to say, we baptize by immersion. And if our great God has taken Brian through so many waters, he will heal him and make him ready to leave this hospital and be baptized in a church before many witnesses. So we waited a few days. And while we waited, Brian took me fishing. And we caught our first, I caught my first Canadian fish on Birch Island in the north. And we celebrated together. And when his neck was properly healed from the surgery, he was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, by immersion. Two years went by, and my, I'm on a day off in Toronto, me and my wife, and we're relaxing. I got a phone call. Uh, Brian is not doing so well, Chris. We're in the Manitoulin Islands. Can you come and anoint him for me? It's a day off. I'm fatigued, Jonathan. But I jumped in the car, and I said, no problem, Lord. Give me the strength to go that far. It's approximately six or six and a half hours. But when God's people call, it's my number one prayer to, to go or else find a day job. And I jumped on that highway by myself with Jesus Christ. Journey arrived six hours later on, and here the story climaxes. 
I arrived, Brother Freddy. I thought he would say, Chris, thank you for coming. All right, Chris, how's the family? Sorry you had to leave your wife. He didn't say none of these things. Not even thank you, I'm happy to see you. Brian's words to me first after that six hours of traveling. Chris, my only faith and hope is in the Lord. If that were the only experience I had for my whole pastoral journey, I could have quit that day and live in a cave until Christ comes. Chris, my only faith and hope is in the Lord. Amen? Pray with me. Our Father God of heaven, our only faith and hope is in you. And as we've heard the words today, O oh God, do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. Protect us from the evil one and lead us in your paths everlastingly. And as we depart, O oh Father, to the Sabbath school room for the, uh, the humility ordinance, Bless even that service as well, O oh Lord, and bless the communion service to follow. For we pray and praise in the name of Jesus Christ, our faith and hope. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.